Okay, so, I'm Jonas Ophanasopoulos, I'm the moderator for this panel, and uh, I am the founder of monopeto.gr, the a Greek website about uh, bespoke tailoring, circular uh, economy, and all of the above. Together we have, let me get my seat seat. Dr. Yanis uh, Vikas, a social expert in the field of sustainability and social economy. Uh, Stavros Tobanidis, founder and managing partner in PHE, uh, And I think uh, the uh, internet is joining us. Uh, Harak Siru, head of Southeast Europe office, Unomia, and Stiliani Paraska, president of Fashion Revolution Luxembourg. I don't know if we see these ladies. Anyway, uh, gentlemen, tell us something about yourself, make a little uh, who you are, what you do. I am uh, Yanis Vikas. I am a course instructor here at the American College of Greece, uh, courses of social economy, entrepreneurship, and sustainable finance and investing. I'm also a postdoc researcher, but I have been actively involved in the last years in the support of uh, initiatives in the field of social and green uh, entrepreneurship. So, hello, good morning, all. My name is Tavso Banidis. I want to thank you, Hadzidex Foundation and American College of Greece, for this invitation. It's my honor being here and speaking to you today. Uh, my background is on finance. I studied finance on the uh, University of Piraeus, but uh, in the second year of my studies I started searching about entrepreneurship in Greece. And uh, in, one, uh, in one TEDx talk back in 2013, which I saw on YouTube while searching about entrepreneurship and the first startups in Greece, I hear a story from Paul Morphy, this uh, I'm sure you are aware, and his daughter will speak, I think, in the next panel. Uh, Paul talked about the seagrass and the huge quantities of seagrass that are available across the Mediterranean coastal areas. And uh, make a call to, an open call to the, to the audience, start acting, uh, use this raw material, which is one, not, in my opinion, of, of the biggest wealth for Greece, uh, upcycle it and create something new. This was a turning point for me. I was really inspired and I took the decision to found Fee, which is now developing composite materials, novel composite materials, by upcycling a different range of natural residues uh, that are massively available in order not to be disposed to landfills, but gain a second life and uh, be in our interiors, in our products, uh, place them in our everyday life because I think that uh, uh, the new materials and uh, the new raw materials that will substitute the existing ones is the biggest starting point regarding sustainability and circular economy. I will tell a little bit more and thank you again for uh, being here. <coughs> Uh, so, I would like to, to mention some of the uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, we have uh, Ms. Xara here and uh, Ms. Tiliani Paraska with us via internet. Welcome, ladies. Nice to be with you. It's okay, the sound is okay, the image is okay. I'm Georgos, hello. And uh, Mr. Stavros, uh, Mr. Chopalidis, I'm sorry, uh, you guys please go. Yes. So, um, even though Professor Apostolaki has named various uh, actions in the field of sustainability that uh, American College of Greece has done in the past years. It's uh, also important to mention some of the initiatives in the field of circular economy that relate more with the concept of circular economy. Uh, so apart from the courses that are uh, uh, 
that prioritize a circular uh, economy like uh, the, the program of environmental studies or the minor of sustainable finance and economics where I also happen to teach. Uh, it's also uh, important to mention some initiatives like the food waste uh, campaign, uh, a campaign about uh, the composting food waste here in the campus. There is uh, a campaign, an initiative uh, in regards to the farmers market, uh, something that runs along with the NGO Borume. Uh, so it's, it runs since uh, 2018, and uh, uh, volunteers from the American College of Greece uh, select uh, uh, collect uh, fruits and vegetables from farmer markets, mostly in Holargos and uh, Palini, and uh, those things are give, being given to humanitarian organizations and uh, other vulnerable groups. Um, there are also programs within the college like the uh, reduction in the, in the use of single, uh, one, uh, one, uh, single use plastics. Also a program reduce, reuse and recycle that has to do with uh, uh, using second-hand furniture and personal computers also. Um, and also in the fields of uh, operations uh, here in the college, the, it's important to mention the use of water from the pool in order to water the gardens. So certainly there are a lot of uh, initiatives that uh, relate to circular economy and that uh, are part of the so-called uh, holistic, uh, the holistic approach about sustainability. Um, it's really important also to mention that all those uh, their sustainability reporting standards and certifications that are being followed. Uh, so within the website, anybody can uh, acquire a lot of information about those uh, specific uh, actions that happen in, the, in uh, in American College with specific uh, indicators. So, yes. Thank you very much. Mrs. Hatsu. Yes, hello. Uh, hi, everyone. And thank you very much also to the Foundation and uh, Daily College for the invitation. I've been listening um, with a lot of interest to the previous also panel um, discussing about sustainability regulation. And uh, um, I think. Uh, from our perspective, I represent uh, a research and consulting uh, company. It's an international consultancy based uh, at the moment in Athens. Uh, we have offices also in Brussels, in, um, in Denmark, in the US, and New Zealand as well. And I would say that we are in the core part of the circular economy. We work a lot with the European Commission on shaping policy through evidence-based work. There is a lot of, and it's already been mentioned, there's a lot of um, current developments on policy level. So we recently had, back in March, the adoption of the, um, we had back in March the adoption of the textile strategy, and before that, a couple of years ago, we had the adoption of the Circular Economy Action Plan. And I think within this action plan, we have a, a wide range of different policy areas looking from all the way from production, eco-design, all the way to consumption and waste. And I think the most important part is to understand also and to facilitate how the different um, steps can be followed on, starting from national governments, all the way to businesses, obviously down to consumers. And as already been said, education is a major aspect. So we know we are um, in Europe, we're consuming uh, a vast amount of um, uh, products and goods and services. It's interesting that also we have been looking at green public procurement and green procurement much more heavily than we used to. Um, and I think an area that I would say you know me certainly focusing on a lot with either national governments or private businesses, organizations and universities is the part on the waste consumption. So how do you actually reduce uh, the waste that you produce on the first place? How do you improve your value chain? But also, um, how do you understand what other actions you can take? Is it about reuse? Is it about refurbishing and remanufacturing? And um, coming down all the way to reducing the waste that ends up in landfill. And we know very well that Greece is having a major problem at the moment we are landfilling more than 80 percent so we definitely need to take some action here and understand what are the different areas which we can improve thank, thank you. you very much miss palaska i have to say i'm a big fan of your work in the organization and uh, the organization as a whole uh, it's a very interesting 
Uh, so yes, there is a fashion revolution office in Greece, which is doing a great job as well. Kiori, my fellow president. Uh, I have been living in the past decade in, in Luxembourg, though, and I have actually brought the movement over there uh, because it was uh, not present yet uh, when I thought, like, yeah, we need to do this. I have been uh, doing a lot in fashion, even before I go to Luxembourg, though. I was working as a fashion um, designer in this, in a brand that is actually, that was very active in upcycling at the time, and now is using natural uh, fabrics uh, exclusively. Mm. So in Luxembourg, I started uh, animating cycling workshops, that is kind of uh, informal education, and I saw the interest, and I saw how everybody could uh, actually uh, understand the problem better by using their hands and by seeing, you know, that we are giving a new life to a product that was, uh, was about to become waste. Uh, so that's how it started, and then we brought Fashion Revolution in Luxembourg. We were hosting a lot of events, uh, also swap events. I think this is a very good practice in the fashion industry. And not, in, not only in the industry, in our everyday lives actually, just exchanging clothes or even looking in the wardrobes of our moms, our, our like grandmothers, or whoever else. And also, of course, second hand. Um, yeah, I'm only supposed to say what I'm doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> or what fashion revolution is doing. Uh, anyways, a lot of things are happening in, in uh, fashion uh, in the fashion sector, in the, the, let's say the sustainable and circular fashion sector in Luxembourg now, and I have a better knowledge there. Um, after our uh, movement came uh, in play, uh, we had then funding from the government. They started another local campaign. They have a pop-up uh, downtown, and they are uh, operating. Uh, like they are selling better products, uh, products that have a social background, that are upcycled, that are made from better materials, also secondhand. Uh, so a lot of buzz over there at the same time is not mainstream. And that's what we are trying to achieve with fashion revolution. Of course, uh, besides uh, improving better, uh, improving working conditions, bringing transparency in the fashion industry, also making this better fashion, this slow fashion, uh, more mainstream, I would say, because it's necessary. First, I want to say that I hate fashion. <laughs> I'm all about classic <laughs> style, and I don't know what is in fashion today. Uh, but uh, I know where my clothes are made and who made my clothes. And I think that's very important. I know by the first name, everybody who made my jacket, my shirt, and I think that is uh, how cellular economy in the fashion industry should work. You should know the person who makes your clothes, the person, what kind of material he uses or she uses, and we should all go back to our tailors, our uh, modistas, I don't know, the, I don't remember the English words for this one, and uh, this is my point of view. Thank you, thank you. But exactly, and I didn't come into this. The two main questions of fashion revolution is who made my clothes and what's in my clothes. These, as you mentioned, are the most essential aspects to know what is the textile, what fiber is uh, the clothes being produced from, and who is producing the clothes. Yeah. So, uh, let's talk about fee. What fee does? So, fee has developed... Uh, and patented the manufacturing technology that starts from uh, receiving feedstocks, bio-residues that are, as I told before, massively available, uh, not across the coastal areas, you know. Who knows fee? Please raise your hands. Only three, eh? Four, five, okay, we can do better, I think. <laughs> Thank you for uh, knowing what we do. So, yeah, we started back in 2015 with a clear vision of uh, giving a second life to Posidonia residues. I'm speaking about seagrass. I'm sure that you have, you know, you are aware of them. You have sold them across the coastal areas. Uh, we identified the problem uh, with uh, the waste 
it's not about waste, with uh, the coastal management of uh, the dead leaves of Poseidonia that are washed up with energy coming from waves to, uh, to the coastal areas. We saw that municipalities collect them and unfortunately burden them to landfills, so they dispose them as a waste. Uh, and we saw a raw material, not a waste, uh, on that. What's the impact of disposing a natural residue to, to landfills? The impact number one is the social, uh, the, the social purpose, which is that uh, we spend, on average, every coastal municipality spends every year 25,000 of euro for burdening them to landfills. So they are paying the 30 euro gate fee that we have in Greek landfills. And on average, they have 800,000 uh, 800, uh, 800, to 1,000 tons of this uh, residue on each coastal municipalities across Greece. So uh, this is the, the social impact of burdening, but of course it's an environmental impact of burdening, which is the greenhouse gas emissions, emissions that are coming from landfills. According to research, 340 cubic meters of methane are being disposed, are being coming from landfills when we burden one ton of this type of residues. So we saw this problem and we designed a technology that instead of disposing, disposing them to landfills, we came up to municipalities and proposed that, okay, we will create a technology that will upcycle them, because we are doing upcycling and not recycling our uh, technology. We need to receive them, please bring it to our small, small factory, and uh, we will upcycle them, we will process them at the first level, we will put the humidity off, we will clean them, we will separate them, and uh, we will have a new raw material ready to be processed. And here is where we came, we found it a way to upcycle them efficiently as a fillers to composite materials. I don't know if you're aware about composite materials. Composite materials are types of materials that are uh, consist of two different ingredients. The one is the filler, which we use the residues, the Posidonia residues, and the other is the thermoset bio-based resin system that we compound them together in order to create our materials, which is produced in seeds. They are panels, uh, surfaces, mainly decorative surfaces that have commercial applications in uh, construction, mainly in interior design, architecture, in furniture applications, which is our main target market right now. Uh, but of course, for a small startup uh, back in 2016 that we started, in order to go and open this market, we started commercialization with products. We have a model that um, we, will give, we will give to other brands and manufacturing companies the raw material, the fee boards, in order to create collections of products. So until today, potentially you know fee about your products, the eyewear collection, accessories, uh, which of course our materials have applications, but right now we are targeting this market, a new market. And moreover, due to the past two years, we developed with the same technology some new raw materials that I'm happy to share with you today. The one is being produced by upcycling Nespresso spent coffee grounds from their capsules. I'm sure you are aware of the reverse recycling scheme of uh, Nespresso around Europe. Uh, we have the idea to, pro to tell them that apart from uh, disposing them as a compost, we can take the spent coffee grounds use it in our technology and use it as a filler for a new raw material based on your coffee. And uh, in two months we are launching the first product that we designed that we are producing for them, for the Greek market, uh, uh, which is made from the coffee board, which is the new raw material based on spent coffee grounds. We are working with, closely with Nespresso and with Vivartia Group, with, mainly with Everest. Potentially you have seen some stands in the retail produced with their spent coffee grounds. Again, we help them create the reverse, the closed loop re reverse logistic uh, recycling scheme for the coffee grounds, and we develop the material that can be used again in the value chain. And in my opinion, circular economy, which is our topic, yeah. is starting from reusing the, the waste producer reusing his not waste his residue again in his value chain. And I think it's very educational for other investors to follow about the waste that they are producing fashion industry 
uh, has already established uh, those type of initiatives. And yes, we are developing those materials, we are producing them in Patras. We have a, uh, product, a downsized pro uh, production line in Patras and happy to respond and uh, more about what you, how you can utilize our materials in your projects and uh, to present uh, some of them uh, earlier in our small stand back there. Maybe an function, uh, an accessories or something else. There's a, there's a Greek fashion brand that uh, creates handles for women bags with our materials. Yes, so that's we are, nice. So we are sorry. Yeah. Let's break down circular economy. What does it mean to the average guy? And how can he implement it in his life? Well, we are, first of all, we are talking about uh, a single, let's say, uh, concept from uh, getting over the typical uh, model of uh, using, uh, producing, using and disposing something to finding a new uh, use uh, for this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, element and, and product. So trying to, to make a circle, uh, reusing, recycling, all of those concepts are related with the, the concept of uh, circular economy. Uh, we can see various uh, interesting examples, uh, let's say, in the field of, uh, let's start from, from, from industry, for example. The, the concept of uh, industrial symbiosis, industrial ecology, where uh, one uh, the enterprise is using the uh, byproduct of another enterprise uh, as, as an input. So this creates actually uh, a, 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 an eco-industrial um, uh, eco industrial park, an eco-industrial ecosystem, let's say, within this uh, industry. Um, there are certainly a lot of ways also in, this, in the everyday life, let's say, when we just prefer to use uh, a glass, a very used glass, when we, uh, uh, to drink our coffee or to drink uh, uh, our, our water. So there, the ways of expressing uh, circular economy both uh, as a citizen but we also see it in the corporate uh, world and there are various uh, uh, examples that uh, we, can, uh, we can see in the field. Actually, um, it's fee for example, for fee is one of the good practices that we uh, express uh, in the, as, as an example in the field of social economy and uh, green entrepreneurship and there are actually a lot of interesting uh, other concepts to, to mention uh, in those uh, uh, as good practices, uh, starting also from other examples of uh, Restia, a social enterprise that is uh, actually using uh, uh, the human hair and the furs of animals in order to create, uh, um, uh, to, to gather oil from uh, pollution in the sea. So they make specific filters out of uh, human hair. The person who thought about it is a hairdresser. So we, we uh, also we know Siedia magazine that now the, they they try to create products out of uh, the street uh, the street paper that they are uh, that they actually not sold. Um, there are various um, uh, examples that we see out there, and sometimes we tend to uh, not 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 to pay attention to them. But there are definitely a lot of uh, examples that we all should relate as citizens, but also to see them in the corporate uh, world in the field of circular economy. Thank you very much. Ciru, uh, Miss Ciru, uh, what does Unomia do in the Central Economy Department? Ah, Excuse me, could you repeat this? Because I couldn't hear you very well. Let's talk about Unomia. Did you listen? Yes, yeah, okay. So, in terms of what we do, um, you can hear well because my things are quite messy. Have a um, okay. You got listen? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, I think the internet connection is a bit unstable. That's yeah. why it's giving me a message, but I can hear you well. So in terms of what you know it does uh, within the circular economy, um, let's say spectrum, um, I think I mentioned earlier that we work a lot with the European Commission on shaping policy, either that falls under the, the circular economy action plan. So we developed a study where we looked at different range of product categories, looking at textiles, looking at toys, electronics, um, 
looking at packaging and construction pro products. And we looked at the different uh, hotspots identified within the European Union. We looked at the less popularity within this product category, and then we came up with a number of recommendations, as well as um, sort of implementation plans for these industry areas. <clears throat> and that formed part of the e circular economy action plan. It was also the initial stage of uh, starting to understand better how textiles are being treated also within the European Union. Um, we also work a lot with national governments, so when the policy is out, we work a lot on the Single Use Plastics Directive, which in fact is about banning a number of different product categories uh, when it comes to uh, single use plastics, phasing them out from the market, but also uh, finding alternatives. So we've done impact assessments to understand how these alternatives can be phased in into the market uh, by still providing um, a competitive advantage to the industry. Um, and obviously, if you look in a recent paper and the link part of those products, we've done a number of studies in reduced body pollution. Well, and I think throughout this um, this range of different uh, studies, we also could read from the government and came to either the local waste management or now there is a lot um, especially in Greece with a new circular economy strategy that was actually adopted a couple of months ago. Um, we are looking to support and help definitely regional and local government to understand how they can go about it. It's about understanding the we think of course your waste can be um, the first, but also very difficult task here in Greece, reusing, which is a very, very important part of the knowledge when the fashion industry is also very uh, key. Understanding um, also how you can recycle better. For example, uh, we know that textiles globally uh, get recycled only at one percent, so it's a very, very small uh, percentage. And um, we also look at how materials are being used within, you know, uh, specific borders. So we currently see, for example, huge production if we move away from the textiles um, of lithium outside the EU that we need to actually consume and we need to, let's say, use lithium within our product categories here in, in the European Union. But we know that this is actually a problem. We're not recycling lithium here, but there are many different uh, parameters to take into consideration. So I would say that we try to work both with the decision make policymakers and the regional and local governments to uh, help policy being implemented. And I think as it was said earlier, it is the most difficult task here in Greece. Regulations are out there. There are many different requirements, many different articles, but implementing such um, articles in the right way is the hardest part, and I'm, I'm guessing most of people would agree. Um, and I would say that there are definitely steps. Um, we've seen definitely uh, a lot of steps happening and moving forward. We did a study on um, specifically on um, introducing um, a new scheme, which is about producers pay for the amount um, of material, you know, specific of units they put into um, the, the national, into the Greek market. And this is called Extended Produce Responsibility Scheme, and it's applied in out of member states. Actually, it is obligatory across the EU for different types of materials. So, for example, textiles is one that we have seen uh, uh, the so-called Extended Produce Responsibility Scheme being implemented in France. Um, and it's a joint system, but we want to be able to bring it to Greece because there is now a new market for all EU member states to be able to collect, uh, for example, textiles by 2025 and sustainably also manage the waste of, of those textiles. So it's important to identify how we will do that. So this is one of the ways we, we are supporting also the ministry. Um, we've done this uh, study and also uh, regional and local governments to understand how much they produce and how they can actually um, reduce the consumption and manage it more sustainably. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Paraska, let's talk about, uh, it's a, a world trend uh, in these days 
we buy a garment, we wear it uh, one or two, three times, and then we throw it away. Okay, uh, that wasn't the idea when uh, our parents lived. The, the garments uh, were expensive, they were hard to make, and uh, you, you used to uh, take care of the garments so they can last longer, and maybe you can pass it down to your son or your daughter or somebody else in the family. Uh, in, in our days, this thing has... There is no, there's no such thing. Such thing uh, uh, um, how can the fashion industry uh, become more cellular? Great, great. Thank you for putting this up. And yes, uh, as you said, in our um, parents' and grandparents' times, yes, exactly, clothes were hard to make and hard to break as well. They were really durable, and that aspect has been gone from away. Uh, what you mentioned, yes, is the fast fashion uh, strategy, unfortunately, strategy, no, it's a business model. Uh, only brands uh, currently, or most of them, are operating uh, by this system. Uh, fast fashion uh, business model it means producing uh, the cheapest possible garments in massive, massive production and uh, selling them for as cheap as possible and then throwing them exactly after a couple of times of wear because they cannot last longer anyways. How can we make this scheme better? Well, first of all, uh, obviously by changing the business model and this is something that we see happening today, like really slow steps, but let's hope they are steady steps. Uh, there are a lot of startups, so the easiest thing right now is to to look at startups, to look at new companies that have circularity in their DNA. It's very hard right now for the huge companies that started uh, using the fast fashion model, even is unsustainable, to uh, turn them around and make them uh, sustainable. I mean, they're doing a lot of steps, so okay, let's explain this first. They, there are steps being made also with fast fashion brands. They are trying to sell second-hand, for instance, and there is a big trend now uh, in that sector, in the luxury resale sector, in second-hand sector in general. Uh, a lot of platforms like Vinted, this is a European unicorn startup, uh, the Real Real, the American platform, the Stia Collective, this is a French startup, amazing startup, uh, uh, founded by two women also, uh, really crazy inspiring. So, a lot of brands are collaborating with these platforms to sell their clothes that are being that are used after they are used by the first user, let's say, to, to have them in a resale platform and to, of course, um, guarantee that they are, uh, they are real, that they are in good condition, that they are like authentic, let's say. So, this is a good first step by big brands. Uh, unfortunately, probably they are slower in different areas, like working conditions, but then again, okay, this is in general part of, of sustainability, but not really circularity. Another aspect is, of course, materials. We have seen some improvement. There are a few brands, or most of the brands, actually, and this many, many times, like quite often, is used as a greenwashing uh, technique. Uh, many brands, even the worst, are, are using better uh, textiles for a few lines, for only a few collections, not for the whole uh, production. And they are uh, marketing them, and they are uh, saying, we have a new green line, we have an echo line. Uh, okay, <laughs> new washing is just like horrible, obviously. There are also laws now to um, protect the consumer. Uh, but uh, if all these big brands put focus on materials and working conditions at the same time, and also on take back schemes. I mean, and this is again the last uh, resort, so recycling is the last resort. The first thing uh, brands should do are basically design better, design for disassembly, design for longer life. Uh, this assembly, I mean, yeah, it sounds as it belongs to the, more to technology than to fashion, but. Uh, a garment also can be disassembled in a way to be recycled better, uh, like buttons, you know, threads, textile, and zippers, etc. There is a certain way that you can design a clothing 
two babies assembled and to be recycled, probably to 100 to 100 percent, maybe not to 100 percent, but to let's say close to, to that. Uh, also, uh, giving more money to R&D research and uh, development uh, is right now not there yet to support a circular fashion, um, a circular fashion system. Uh, recycling is not uh, uh, as advanced right now. We cannot recycle uh, most of the garments. Uh, the garments that are not monomaterial, that are mixed, cannot be uh, recycled at this point. Uh, for now, what we are saying is that we need to use textiles that are 100% cotton, 100% linen, and this way we can assure that they can be uh, recycled. But of course, we need to first build the take-back systems. So each brand either has to outsource this to a brand that can do it better than them, or build their own take-back system, uh, give some incentives to consumers, etc., and tell them to bring back uh, the clothes after they have worn them and they don't want to keep them any longer, to uh, make them uh, textiles again. And this is a big part of circularity, where repair is another part of circularity, of course, and that is uh, that goes to the consumers. When the consumer has a bathroom missing, sees a hole or something, um, or he wants to alter the garment, he uh, somehow needs the education, I would say, first, and he needs to be willing not to just throw away the garment, but to spend a bit more time and just a bit more uh, money, let's say, to repair it and to wear it again. And I mean, uh, we need to build this connection, this sentimental connection with our clothes. Um, you know, like Frida, we love our clothes and we want to keep them longer. We want to live, you know, adventures with them and have memories with them and not have them like just for one of anything that's it. Yeah, I, I think I should stop. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> Thank you, Vilas. Uh, a lot of times uh, young men ask me, okay, let's go bespoke, let's go all natural uh, in our garments, but it's, it's, it's expensive, you know. Uh, they think that the uh, bespoke uh, jacket costs about uh, two or three thousand uh, euros. That's not the case. But it's another, it, there's another solution. Classic style never goes out of fashion. So you can go and get second hand garments. Get a great jacket, a great tweed jacket, let's say, that has been tailored uh, in the 1970s and is as just as new today. It's totally totally in fashion. Let's talk about Greece and how Greece is treating you as a startup in this uh, um, uh, field. Yes. For me it's not about Greece. Uh, when you are designing and running a company you have always to find a way in your strategy to, uh, to be up and running. Of course, we started back in 2015, where startups was um, and the industry was at its beginning. So, uh, I think that the past years there are many interesting initiatives that are trying to help and support. Uh, I want to be extremely honest that we are very from the first days that we pitched our idea to create new materials. Uh, I was. I think that. Uh, I'm lucky that I found the supporters, foundations in Greece, uh, startup awards, contests that help us raise the first amount of money to do our R&D and being able to run the company. Because we started from a private R&D, we didn't have anything, only one idea. And uh, together with my co-founder, uh, which is a mechanical engineer expert on composites, uh, we started from a garage of my grandfather in Patras and uh, set up the whole, uh, the whole technology online. So, uh, I think in Greece uh, there are many good things, many, uh, many others. The, the, the taxation is on a very good stage right now, uh, but Greece is a small market for us. And this is the main problem I can share with you today, that uh, still the industry is not uh, educated, of course, and not open uh, to use, let's say, bio-based materials. And I, in my opinion, this is the biggest problem for small startups on this sector, that they are 
they are they are trying to enter the market. They are trying to find the cash flow in order to let's say invest in R and D, uh, optimize their strategy, design new products based on the feedback from the clients. And uh, the problem is that if the market that you're acting can't support you, you, you have two options. Either go away, go abroad, and uh, let's say design your business development only to be on Central Europe or where your target market is. And uh, this is a problem that we're currently facing. Um, that's all for, for me regarding Greece and the circular economy. Uh, of course, there are many interesting uh, initiatives, uh, projects that are now up and running. I think that um, circularity is all about design. And yeah. when you are uh, circularity, and in my industry of materials, starting from feedstocks, and it's very important to uh, secure the feedstocks and the bio -ba new bio based value chains in order our technology to make sense for the client, for the special. We are not alone. There's a waste management company that taking the capsules, uh, separating the coffee from the aluminium. And this is all about collaborations. We, we have the solution of creating uh, unique materials that can bring it back to life, but we need to collaborate. In Greece, we are still not collaborating, and this is not changing in my opinion. And uh, as I also heard, and I'm now closing from the previous panel, we are still in Greece. Ra don't have any any legislation regarding uh, sustainability. Two years ago, I was invited from a minister of, an, uh, of environment here in Greece and told me that we are currently establishing uh, the green sourcing of our materials that we will use in the public spaces and the public areas. I don't know about you. I read the, the two weeks ago environmental law in Greece, and still I didn't read one metric any metrics, no numbers, how you can measure your impact you know, with, a, with a law when you don't have metrics, and still we don't do anything on green supply. When you have green raw materials in Greece, you're, you're seeing today what happens with the cost of raw materials and all the problems with logistics, and you are not trying to set up a strategy that we source from local producers in order to uh, further further increase my decrease my environmental footprint and create a market this is not sustainable so uh, in my opinion and there's a total lack of strategy still for this country in many in all of the industries of course we have tourism of course we have shipping which is the two main uh, industries but in my opinion, we still run out of strategy. We don't have strategy, and this is a problem that uh, will not make entrepreneurship, circularity, sustainability sustainable for the next year. Yeah. And I think uh, Dr. Vikas um, put that on this. In, yes, uh, actually, the, the one thing is if something exists, if an action plan exists, the second thing is uh, how all these things are going to be implemented. So, starting from a European level, uh, since 2020, there is an EU action plan on circular economy, uh, focusing on various uh, sectors and fields that uh, uh, have an, a higher environmental burden, let's say, in the field, and things could be done like uh, electronics, vehicles, uh, uh, plastics, uh, uh, food and waste. Um, now, in Greece, we had a strategic plan since 2018 from the Ministry of Energy and Environment. Uh, now in 2020, in November 2021, uh, actually a new action, national action plan on circular economy was being made and uh, encompassed the European direction. Uh, focusing on various fields, I think they're a bit generic at this, uh, at this level, so focusing on sustainable uh, uh, consumption, on sustainable production, so uh, uh, in the field of eco-labeling, uh, eco-certification, namely some issues, uh, namely the, the things on industrial situations that I mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, the specific actions that have been done, uh, I could say that it's the law of 2020 on uh, single use of uh, plastics, not uh, reducing the uh, uh, single use plastics. Uh, there is an action plan on green public procurement, but it's 
things to be done. We have actually the uh, social public procurement, so public procurement uh, that has clauses, social clauses that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, favors uh, social enterprises that integrate uh, people from vulnerable groups exists, but from for green public procurement we don't have yet these uh, clauses. Uh, they are starting, they say that they are starting to uh, encompass them in various um, uh, public, let's say, competition where someone can apply. Uh, it's also important to mention that in this action plan there are some specifications on uh, uh, prioritizing, let's say, fields of circular economy in the National uh, Strategic Reference Framework in the new uh, ESPA. And uh, there have been uh, something has been done also in the field of eco labeling in general. But um, an important thing also on ESGs, uh, on uh, the field of uh, circular economy, is that uh, what will be, let's say, the what happens if you don't do it in a way? It's like in a sort of an action plan. Most of those actions are not enforced in uh, legislation, they're just strategic plans. So uh, this is also uh, a thing to be seen uh, what will be done if someone does not uh, comply with those uh, regulations. But certainly in the last years, there have been at least the last three years sort of uh, actions also in the field of circular economy. I don't know if they help you, but they have started at least to be, yeah, to, to exist. Yeah. I think that they are translating in Greece uh, the uh, things coming from EU, papers coming from EU, mainly from the European Green Deal, that of course has specific metrics for, for many industries. But okay, of course the decarbonization is one of the most critical parts, but it's not only decarbonization from transportation and decarbonization from energy production. There are also the raw materials, which is huge huge in my opinion it's a huge impact on uh, the environment and on the human health because something that is very important and I'm sorry for uh, taking the something that's very important speaking about circular economy and new materials is that uh, and it all starts from the design of a material you it's, it doesn't make sense only to take a bio residue and create a material you have to design a material that is toxic free toxicity in our interiors is uh, is a very important reason of cancers for today. I'm sure you're aware from formaldehydes that are mainly used for the production of composite parts like uh, wooden boards, acoustic panels and all this stuff. So circularity and uh, sustainability, which is our main topic today, is changing all, not only the raw materials and not subsidizing plastics, but is also designing human healthy and untoxic raw materials. It's something I, it's really important to have in mind when you are reading about something that says that it's sustainable. Read about the toxicity, read about the, the ingredients that they have, because it's very important. Miss Cheru, uh, has Greece has a long way to go for uh, Circular economy. I'm, I'm sorry, again, I missed your question at the beginning of the question. Can yeah. you, can you uh, the question? Greece has a long way to go for circular economy. Yeah, so I've been listening to the other panelists and it's really interesting because I come from more of a maybe research and um, let's say report related uh, sort of background research and evidence based. And I would say that yes. Um, definitely Greece has a long way to go. Uh, we talked about having some policies in place but needing more in terms of implementation. But I would say that uh, before we even answer this question, the first question is whether the EU has set up enough, um, uh, let's say, communication and guidance when it comes to new regulation and um, commission decisions and directives that are being released uh, from, from Brussels. So I would say that uh, it happens many times that these regulations and directives are being released. Uh, they have been worked uh, out quite a long time before they clearly been released uh, with loads of consultations. But when they come out and the member states have to go and adopt and implement, um, I think what sometimes is lacking is 
the how, the way it's going to be implemented, and especially when you're talking about countries that are not uh, Germany and France and uh, Sweden and Belgium. We're talking about, the, uh, you know, in the waste sector, we call them the backlagging countries. So countries that we have a longer way to go because we have been using our landfill sites for a very long time. We have been consuming maybe, um, maybe around the same pace, but actually we're not, we haven't been very good at understanding how we better use our resources. And I think transparency is another issue. So we tend to maybe look at Greece and blame it very quickly. Uh, but I would say that we need to be very careful also at how the, the guidance and all the communication is coming up from the EU and making sure that we, you know, we've got the, the, the right tools. And when all these ESPA and new funding schemes and mechanisms are actually released, it's great. But when you speak to businesses and also SMEs, and 99% of the businesses in goods are SMEs in fact, um, it's interesting to hear that they don't have access to funding. They don't have access to those financial mechanisms. And you wonder, what is the best way? Is it best to go then back? You have to do this. There's a top-down approach, but there's a bottom-up approach as well. You need to speak to either your regional, your local, your regional, or your national authority, the focal point, understand how you can better access that funding. And sometimes it's not even you know, that possible. And obviously, I don't want to sound gloomy or um, negative. I think we have, um, and Greece has shown, we've done a study for SEPAN, which is the Federation of uh, Recycling Industries in Greece. And we have seen case studies, very good uh, examples in the food waste sector for municipalities uh, in Africa region, like Boulevard of Yarmen is one, but now there are many, many more. We're looking also at what we, the retail sector is doing in the um, in reducing food, but also, in fact, uh, making sure that they don't uh, even purchase huge uh, amounts when it comes to when they reach their stores. Um, and making sure that they can do something about it, and there are lots of organizations dealing also with the unwanted food. There's a lot going on in packaging. Uh, in the packaging sector, there's new guidance from the European Commission on uh, better design of packaging, uh, lower weight, um, uh, better recyclable material, obviously, to be able to recycle 100%, and of course, making sure that there is there are the right containers and the right infrastructure to take those uh, waste streams packaging uh, for reprocessing. However, um, in Greece, for example, in the packaging sector, the larger companies, the bigger brands, are the ones at the moment that we see they're making uh, uh, an impact. However, it's interesting also to see that there are smaller ones that they're now coming out. They're trying to also establish some funding and you see, for example, more sustainable, and this is a very, just one example, um, straws made out of, um, which is called, uh, I can use one of the names, which I find very interesting, called Staramaki, out of wheat. And they've got an incredible business model behind it. And they started really from scratch. Metal and steel, we do have good case studies and good examples for the recycling of steel and metal in Greece. Actually, we're one of the, I would say, sort of pioneers in that area and also waste oil, which is another area that is growing. So I would say that, yes, it has a long way to go. I think we need to be even more critical with the way things are handed over to us. So we need to be more critical when we you know, either receive guidance or policy papers, etc., and understand how we can transpose that better and translate that into action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Palaska, how, how, how can we make uh, Greek men and women uh, believe in second-hand clothes? By the way, <laughs> we are having this discussion very often. You know what, the thing is, um, there's still a stigma in Greece. I'm not sure why exactly. Maybe because we are closer to times of um, very low income, to times of war, etc. I mean, closer than other countries, right? Um, there is a stigma associated with second hand and people want to wear new and they feel mm, second hand is like for poor people, which is totally not the case elsewhere. How we have the expression of to sakai ke to makariti uh, in Greece. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> huge challenge, huge challenge. You know what, this is changing through social media. So I think for new generations, this is becoming a trend as well in Greece. Uh, because, of course, they see it everywhere. They see even uh, 
stars now, this is like a good example, stars at Hollywood, let's say, they come to the red carpet and they make it a trend, they make it a statement to wear uh, uh, like a really nice dress, let's say, that they wore 10 years ago, now, 10 years after. It's also a statement of showing how uh, in shape they are 10 years after, so they can wear the same uh, item. But it's also a statement, for instance, uh, about Jane Fonda and a few others. They are, it's a statement also for the environment, because there are some stars that are really activists and they really care for the planet, they care for the environment, and it's a way to show that there's no shame in wearing something twice. Because it's not only about second hand, there is a shame right now uh, in showing up to events and also showing up on social media wearing the same item twice. I'm sure you and me don't have this problem. I have been probably wearing this for I don't know how many years. <laughs> but yeah, there is, uh, this is a real problem in, in some other, let's say, <laughs> uh, ages or, uh, yeah. Uh, how, how, how? I mean, it's, tr it's tricky. I think definitely uh, influencers and stars and all these people that have a following, they can help in making this more mainstream. Uh, also more accessibility, obviously, because in Greece, I think we don't have so many shops that sell second hand right now. Uh, you have many more uh, Zara's and H&M's than anything else, actually. Uh, also online, I see that online this is becoming a bit more popular. I see people selling their clothes on Facebook marketplace, on eBay. Uh, I think somehow accelerating these changes via education would be very important. Uh, for instance, we are going to uh, schools in Luxembourg and we are explaining, I mean, they are already, they, they know already these things in Luxembourg, most of the young people, but we are uh, organizing, you know, uh, some workshops, we are organizing swapping events, uh, upcycling workshops, and showing the coolness, the cool part of being uh, sustainable in fashion, of being circular, of being responsible, because this is actually being responsible towards our planet. Uh, so yes, I think combining the cool aspect of it and uh, like being educational but in a cool way, uh, also utilizing figures that have power and that have following would be the way. And. Um, yeah, I don't know. TV is still a thing in Greece. I think if we saw this more on TV, I mean, I don't watch TV, but I think many people do. That Thank you very also. much, Sol. Okay. I think that uh, concludes our panel. It's time for a break, I think. And uh, thank you very much, all. <laughs>